Calling All Explorers is a podcast from the Harvard Innovation Laboratory in Boston. Your hosts are Harvard Business School alumnus Ronald Terrazas and me, Harvard junior Jessica Pizzolides. Along with Dr. Gordon Chu, we are co-founders of iLab member Fingra, a for-profit public benefit corporation dedicated to discovery, development and commercialization of materials that can transform humanity's ideas of sustainability and ecology. Dr. Chu is our regular guest. He is a globally recognized scientist who is author or co-author of 41 international patents, many dealing with the wonder material graphene. He is a distinguished alumnus of Harvard Business Analytics Program and of Wharton's Advanced Management Program. Hi, Dr. Chu. Uh, formally, yes. Hi, Jesse. <laughs> Hi. Um, so yeah, so today would love to talk a little bit about this concept that you said you've been working on for, for several years about kind of using graphene for food cultivation. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how this how this started and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, um, so Hong Kong is something we brought up a few times in our discussions, right? And also... Mm-hmm. In our in our casual conversations, I, I keep stressing that one should be uh, casual in all their interviews and and discussions because casual uh, tends to be authentic and you yourself, right? Um, Agreed. But more importantly, it's easier on the listener um, <laughs> that they they feel like they're eavesdropping into a conversation as opposed to. I made this just for you. So things that I don't believe you should hear, I took those out, right? Mm-hmm. The authenticity is, is is lacking when you have that. Um, it, it's, it's more staged. Those are the kinds of words that one might hear. And I believe that most people might prefer the raw truth, right? Agreed. And um, Right? So if you just um, are having jet lag, as you mentioned, <laughs> Uh, from Cambridge, right? Cambridge to London, London then to Cyprus, right? Um, mm-hmm. Then, 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 yeah, that let it be, right? Uh, we want, we want to know that. That's why, that's why um, you know people should know. I was one of the early uh, movement leaders in the in the um, gluten free movement um, in Hong Kong, um, starting with myself going gluten free. Um, a few years after I started doing the radio show there. Um, and one of the things that triggered a lot of transformation, one was I, I, I was just, I was an MD PhD candidate starting in the year, you know, 2001. And, um, and there was a lot of stress, as you know, in undergraduate at the H there's a lot of stress. Well, imagine medical school and the PhD Mm -hmm. program and, um, 9-11. So you're going to have a lot of stress and stuff happened in my body where uh, it just wasn't right. And I became, you know, uh, but I, I was also dealing with, like you, all kinds of things that were happening that would, that you just have to do because, because it's all on the up upside, right? So, so um, dietarily, I had an opportunity to um, transform uh, the the massive weight gain and 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 the inability to ha- do anything but to use my brain to study and to constantly add more things into my head, um, but gluten free um, helped me uh, take that weight down as well as mm-hmm. uh, get the energy up, and um, and that happened as I studied naturopathic medicine. So four years I at see. Mount Sinai followed by naturopathic medicine, um, I entered as a, as, as a, um, qu- somewhat of a skeptic, um, because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are unproven. Um, but then what is proof, right? And how many N numbers do you need before you're convinced? Um, if you're thinking of obstetrics in medicine, you really can't prove that um, that the method you apply to your first child can apply to the second child um, okay. because the second child, you'll be older. You won't be in the same time and place as the first, um, your, your first one. So mm-hmm. 
uh, you can apply the same thinking to dates. Imagine applying everything that didn't work out in the first one and just applying it and saying, now I'm not going to do those things. Well, you know, then we have, we have, we, you know, some people may say, why are you bringing your skeletons? Like, oh, I love the way you do this. Um, I wish you didn't remove that from the relationship. However, the other person doesn't know what you removed. So they're just assuming, right? They're assuming that this is, this is, this is you, except you've changed, right? Or you've altered mm -hmm. something. So in the gluten-free drive, um, it came because, and I brought it and shared it with people in Asia, um, because it, it largely transformed my life, despite my skepticism and, 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 um, and, and, but then if we look at why it did it, one of the reasons was, um, was I had some kind of subclinical allergy to the gluten. It wasn't celiac. It wasn't okay. something because, because I could, I could function. So I believed, but try compare and contrasting functioning at, uh, being able to do three times the amount, four times the amount of learning um, absorption, right? Um, of course, I'm older because I worked in corporate and I did other things. Um, so imagine being able to function at this higher rate. And, and once you get off the gluten, imagine yeah. occasionally going back to the gluten, right? Occasionally, mm -hmm. because you're a skeptic, so you, and then getting very sick from doing that. Oh, yeah. so I could compare and contrast that more. So that was the first in inroads into my good, my goodness, food uh, can do a lot. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. so getting into an MD PhD candidacy where all your expenses are paid, you also have a salary to study medicine, you have no debt, just to give some aura into what that was. And then going four years into that, adding naturopathic medicine on top of this, getting funded separately. Um, to go and do the stint in naturopathic medicine when 99.999% uh, don't have that because it's not a federally funded program. So you get private investment on top of that. And because you were in Goldman Sachs, you could imagine mm -hmm. as an intern, the summer intern, you can imagine the capital and who's, what kind of, like, how do you get that kind of funding where you also get the housing? You get the um, the tuition. You also get a salary. So you modeled the same thing off the MD PhD, and you got it funded, and you also got your clothing paid for, <laughs> and three nice. three three airplane tickets, um, all business class covered. <laughs> so that was the negotiation um, that happened out of um, out of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Right. It wasn't with even because the you see the people in in China already believe in naturopathic medicine, but they call it traditional Chinese medicine. Philosophically, okay. it's very similar, um, except that the all the herbs are now different. They're all Western based. Um, they could be Greek based. They could be Latin based. Therefore, I had to learn a lot of Latin um, in um in in the um, in the world of uh, botanical medicine, right? Huh. So Interesting. Now, some there's a quote out there that says, "Food is medicine." Right? Yeah. Herb, herbs are medicine. So imagine getting funded to experience that, um, and and um, and then and then and then and then with your skepticism, you get transformed and changed, right? Mm -hmm. So carry that into the world of graphene, which, so I'm going to give you some years. 2001 was Mount Sinai. Add four years, so that's 2005. 2005 to 2006, that time period was, those two years was at the University of Bridgeport studying naturopathic medicine, a completely accredited program, but because of comparison of what that was and then my ability to do more, you were you were sharing with me that um, on top of everything you're doing, you also have an opportunity to tweak your club involvement, right? Right. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. In fact, <laughs> right after our podcast, right? So so imagine if you could do ten times more than you were doing eventually, 
by um, removing the gluten. And you don't know this, right? And so you're resistant, but at first it's the 300% increase, then it's 400, 500, 1000% increase in capability, being able to see patterns, watch the movie Limitless. And it's kind of, of like, that, right? <laughs> That's what happened to me. I could wow. now put together patterns in my head in light speed. Now, you also have the, op, the, the, the pleasure and the honor of being my partner, right? In Fingra mm -hmm. and your, your podcast hosting, right? And, 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 you know, out of the, uh, as a member of the Harvard Eye Labs, right? So you have this, but you saw the letter from William Potter, right? Yes. Right. I sent you, right. I sent you two letters he wrote about me in 2010 and 2017, but you didn't see the 2023 version in December because he hadn't written yet. Right. And mm -hmm. I, I thought that because you are going through the PIC, the President's Innovation Challenge at Harvard, it would be good to have his letter, uh, whether it's provided to you, uh, to the um, to the family fund, um, but also um, just so you can put some timelines together and piece that together. So when I finished Bridgeport in 2006, as I'm ramping up my 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 thousand percent right improvement in 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 putting patterns together right um and the things i would do there because at mount sinai first year i was already a derm fellow under professor watch and way being able to put together molecules for dermatologists and formulations so um so that was your first year at med school well you're supposed to finish med school then become a fellow i had the opportunity to do that because they wanted somebody who had formulaic experience. And because I had Pfizer and Merck, this was very convenient, right? So imagine what would happen in the botanical medicine world and all the formulas I'd be able to create. And then to attract the Shishados, the Estee Lauders, the, mm -hmm. uh, the L'Oreal's in Asia. Wow. And imagine so attracting doors. Cosmopolitan magazine um, and you're mm -hmm. writing the dermatology dictionary that also now encompasses both the, the allopathic standard dermatology side, but also now talking about Botox and talking about um, various therapies, and then talking about the usage of Arnica for, for bruising. And, and, and then you add in sarcopenia and also the collagen reduction, which is why a lot of older individuals start bruising and then take that radio program that was in 2001 and and then multiply that across uh, a number of channels by 2006, seven. So we're constantly mushrooming. Um, and eventually um, you become, you form this moat around you that is, uh, that is very, very far away. You run into William Potter, you're starting to do a bunch of deals for an investment bank, a boutique investment bank, back to back, you're doing 10 X's. Um, you're taking companies that are actually failed, rebuilding their technology. This becomes in Wall Street because in 2008, in two years, I would have left Hong Kong and then gone to the US to start looking at possibilities on Wall Street when everybody was leaving, right? To 09, you know, 20, so by 2010, he and I are working together. And having a scientist in an investment bank, a boutique one, um, this is unheard of. Like, right? So, <laughs> right? It's just like, you know, there's no, there's no application for these Immediate types of Immediate application, yeah. Right? Yeah. There's nobody else competing with you. But what the reputation I cut in Hong Kong allowed me then to look like a star in New York, had I not gone to Hong Kong and not taken those stints and not done the naturopathic medicine, I would look like any, I would look pretty ordinary and go get your licenses if you want to work on Wall Street. I didn't have to do any licensing because I wasn't dealing with the investments, uh, the sell side or the buy side. I wasn't dealing with that. I was simply looking at the technology that these uh, micro caps and small companies were bringing in. Um, they're beyond startup because at least they made it to Wall Street, but their technology was largely flawed um, because the time and place their technology was in uh, was flawed. So I'll give you an example. A company creates an antibacterial 
kind of like a 409 or a um, Lysol kind of thing. And there's already 409 in Lysol, um, but it's for spinach, Okay. which is great. E. coli on spinach, but that's so few years ago. And Mm. I said, well, what's the latest and greatest is happening? And I bring it to NYU and I talk with other people and I find out that um, that the flavor of the year was going to be swine flu. Oh, okay. And So E. coli, oh, E. coli wasn't hot then. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I mean, if you work on something, if you provide a solution for something that's passed, then how exciting is that versus um, how exciting would it be if your solution could be for something that hasn't happened yet? So we, I matched it with the swine flu. It wasn't called the swine flu at the time because it hadn't gone pandemic yet. And Okay. this biotech company, we had the time that like four months or so before it went to pandemic, uh, we got the ability to go on the road show. And then, and then the valuation of the company went from 7 million to 40 plus 50 plus million, then to 180 million within six months. Wow. Yeah. So it was like, you know, then, then if you do that again, And again and again and again, right? Then there's a pattern. People would push their business card over and said, How are you able to do this? One of the keys was to take something that had failed and then to look at was their failure it's, and you filter it so that it's not based on their technology or who they are as a failure, but you start unlocking the time and place. matching the correct time and place with the technology for the highest valuation possible. Wow, And then you cross that your makes fingers, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, right. So, so now I'm getting you into that mindset, right? Mm And, -hmm. uh, and then, and then look at, and remember I have the food and what my personal experience with the food, um, but there are no deals on wall street relating to food that I did. Right. It was just continuously, um, you know, from a guy who comes in and says, I want to, um, I have a publicly traded company, but um, it, like a shell and I'm on the, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the smaller exchanges. So they're not on NASDAQ or the major boards, but they're on the minor boards, right? So like the OTC, right? Over the counter uh, QB or something like that. So he, he happens like these people are fairly sophisticated. I don't know how they do this, but they came in and he says to me, He wants to be able to read people's dreams from last night. Um, so I'm listening to this, right? And and you you know you you're even if you're just educated to high school, you know that th this doesn't sound right. Are you okay? Right? This doesn't sound right to me. So Yeah. um, I, I said to him, you know, what about what about now? Now remember, you're cloaked by these uh, these places. You know, it's almost like you being an intern at, at Goldman Sachs. Like you have the Goldman Sachs cloak on you. So what you say goes like so much so fur so much further, even though you're an intern, right? So it doesn't matter. So from their mindsets, they're thinking they're meeting the wizard um, behind the curtain, right? The Wizard of Oz. And I'm I'm saying, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. How about you consider? Um, you know, there's there was a product called the clapper, right? And the clapper, the clapper allows you to clap and based on the sound, the, the the light switch would turn on and off. And I said, you know, imagine if you took the clapper and um, and was able to uh, not have to clap. Imagine if you could just blink your eye and the garage door would open or close. Well, that would be a cool party trick, right? Now, Innovation, if we, yeah. <laughs> right, if we could take it another step further, imagine if you didn't need to blink your eye. So now you're not looking at any sensors. Imagine if we could take the alpha and beta waves of your brain and connect it um, so that, and, and teach you how to focus the alpha and beta waves so that you could um, then, then um, turn on and off your garage door or lights and things like that. And, um, and then, so this was at the Consumer Electronics Show. Um, after the guy listened and he thought this was great and we, you know, and there was technology that was available to do this. It was already known. Um, so it's proven technology never before used for this way. And with a little bit of tweaking, it could be used in the gaming world so that if you were playing a shooter game, 
guess who's going to shoot faster? Your fingers, your mouse, or the guy who just, right? Thoughts are so much faster. So it is just all on nerve impulse and, and things like that. So, so, so that valuation also upticked, right? So as I share with you, these valuation upticks, if we fast forward just a little bit, 10 deals forward. So now we're in 20, 2009 still, end of 2009. And along comes this graphite junior that needs about $300 million in general, right? To open up the, the, the mine on this, on this planet earth. And mm -hmm. they are not able to raise the money. Of course, they come to the investment bank to do this. And then in Singapore, the laboratory where I do this, they also come to the, to the investment bank and they say, they have a solution to be able to tell if counterfeit money was counterfeit, right? Okay. You know, using graphene, right? And and <laughs> I and I'm looking at the two parties. They don't know each other, right? But, but because it's coming into deal flow, I look at it and say, you know, I don't know about raising money to open up the mine. I do know graphene is real, all right? And mm -hmm. I know that the counterfeit part. If you're a professor, an academician trying to do something, while the technology is really interesting, I don't know if you can actually lift that while being a professor. And there's many, many steps needed beforehand. So I said, well, what would happen? And here is me cutting the deal now. Uh, now, now I'm cutting the deal because I've had uh, you know 10 experiences prior. And I've always wondered if I had a deal and ran, what would that be? And I would ask Bill this, right? If if I wasn't at the bank, you saw the letter, it says we're friends, right? So I said, if if I actually ran the deal, what would happen? He said, well, you you, uh, you know you for more than they already do. Um, and, and I said, well, what I'm interested in is I'd like to go to Singapore. Um, and uh, but, but before going to Singapore, I would go to all these universities like Princeton, uh, Rutgers, uh, so I did private top school while I was public with near me. And um, and then I would, because I'm in New Jersey, and then I would also go to China because I look at myself in the mirror and I look Chinese and I was at Tsinghua University. And they thought this idea of being able to make graphene from raw or graphite would be intriguing, but beyond their scope. The Singaporeans thought, oh, we'll take that. We love that idea. Um, mm -hmm. So in two weeks' time, that was the proving. It only took about two weeks to show that that was a reality. And that today, that's a granted patent. So by 2012, it became granted, but it only took two weeks of time. Wow. <laughs> right? Quick timeline. <laughs> it yeah, it largely cast a huge um, shadow over counterfeit money, other deals in graphene. Um, and and remember the naturopathic side. So I have to credit where I stand on the shoulders of these giants. You know, if you raise and farm fish versus if you were to catch fish in the wild, do you know that wild fish choose the food that they eat based on how they feel, what's what's available? And they're not eating soy protein 24, uh, seven, 24 hours, seven, seven days a week uh, based on the feeding times, right? They're not having to have a mono diet. Okay. And, and right now, if we, if we knew the consequences, we wouldn't have farmed fish. But one of the I consequences see. was, was the, um, the soy protein. And, and I was ahead of my time on this because I, for my thesis, I would look at like if, if fish oil and whether or not uh, versus caviar. And caviar has parasites, by the way. It can have parasites uh, because you're not going to heat treat. But, but fish oil concentrates and you can even get a prescription level fish oil. So there was a lot of really insightful things that Dr. Maddie, who was at Yale University, and he also happened to be at Bridgeport. So this wasn't like me going all the way to, like I had my brakes on um, mm -hmm. regarding uh, naturopathic medicine and what it would do with my career and, and things like that. But, but the brakes eventually, even though I had the brakes on there with Yale and all that, is I I eventually said, this is really cool stuff. 
like the the way they think is that is that naturally derived things um they didn't say it quite this way but i now term it as naturally derived things probably have a better chance of um perpetuating on earth because they mm -hmm. come from the earth They're so natural. <laughs> so right as opposed to right the the as opposed to synthetic uh chemistry and then saying that I need to put a round peg in this uh, around in in the square, square. Uh, you know square peg in the round hole, right? That's the that's the term. Yeah. Um, and so if it's a mismatch, what what if you know ahead of time what you want to match, and you want more, um, you you want less um, disorder, right? You want less entropy, and you want it to be just naturally ordered to flow into something where you know, the spontaneity would, would be likely. Well, that's, that, that, that's all thermodynamics. So, so, so apparently the thermodynamics in trying to make graphene from raw graphite happens to be, you'll get larger sheets of, of graphene. If it's from a raw source and then you mine the graphite and then you crush the graphite, well, Graphene, which is the smallest component of graphite, is during its graphitic form, can be injured. It is injured. You look at a pencil and it breaks. So yeah. we were able to source better graphenes. Then when the time comes, people will be, uh, organizations will come in droves. So that was the thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And it did happen um, that they came in droves, except that all the people coming didn't really look at food as a problem. They didn't look at um, uranium uh, as a problem. They didn't look at asphalt potholes as a problem. They looked at, oh, I want to make a fishing pole. I want to make sports equipment. Mm -hmm. I want. They did very much the same things as the people who went to um, the crushed graphites or even made the graphenes from other methodologies. And there was, then you have a hard time just explaining yourself, right? Of course. And really and I'm wondering, right. we've, we've kind of, you know, gone through in previous podcasts, just how, you know, graphene in these materials, reactive graphene to be exact, yeah, you know, strengthens them as an additive. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this link between, um, you know, graphene and food and in what ways it yeah. can kind of enhance right. um, its growth. Absolutely. So I didn't forget to answer your question. It just the, 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 the thinking behind how, to get there, right? If I just sure. dump the answer out, right, then it wouldn't. We 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 would we would lose something. So so I want the awareness of all right. So we know that extracting the graphene will give you uh, a very different form of the graphene, but you have to skip graphite to the junior miner. Now that's an advantage because you don't have to raise three hundred million dollars, yeah. right? And you can still do something. To me, um, now I had a university, and I had something outside of Hong Kong that showed that this could be possible and I might get more opportunities in the United States, which is what happened, right? I then got Rutgers. I took the reactive stuff into the plastic. Rutgers had no experience with graphene. And then they were able to find not only that it worked, but it transformed the substrate of the plastic itself so that now Everything that came out of the machine that we created, the process we created, those are process patents and machine patents. The end product was also patentable, and those were composition of matter patents, the ultimate in, in patenting. Because if every time you do this, something new that didn't exist on Earth came out, that, me that meant, and it, and it could come out on Earth in large quantities, that meant that it was it could have happened in the range of possibilities as the earth was forming. It could have happened. These things could have happened, right? So if plastics was, if the time and place of plastics was during uh, a thousand years ago, then then it could have been happening. But it wasn't plastics wasn't around a thousand years ago. So so you say take, take time and place under those conditions. Now, plastics, um, is a is a man-made invention, human-made. Um, so is agriculture, where we grow food and we need large plots of land, right? Mm -hmm. You want to grow food, you grow it outside. The problem of growing it outside is that there's a lot of things that kill our food. 
reduce the efficiency. And what we do as humans is we go and kill them. So we, you know, you touch my food, I will, I will take your life. So what are those examples? Insecticides, pesticides, and of course, also genetically modifying the food. So some people are really against the genetic modification, making sense of, of how, how, how do I know that if you accelerate the modification in your way, it might be a good thing for me, right? So, so you have a lot of tension in all three areas. Insecticides, how do I know the dosage was enough? Nobody's doing a dose response of the insecticides. They're basically saying, what did you use last year? Oh, I, and I want a, I want more crops. So I want to I want to I want to do um, I want to do more uh, so that I could get more yield, right? So you're mm -hmm. not thinking of that. And then you also have the fourth area, which is antibiotic use. Um, so in the in the use of fertilizer, the animal the animals that get sick, you also use antibiotics. And so that fecal matter and those types of fertilizers end up also containing antibiotics. And so you've got those four um, threats to our food system. But mm -hmm. we do these things because cheap food, inexpensive food leads to um, a lot of really, really good times <laughs> for many people, right? You know, you look at Maslow's hierarchy and you see that the th first thing is you need food and shelter. Right. So it makes sense that this is where we are, except that now, as we have more climate change and and extreme conditions, let's put it that way, um, we 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 see the problem that arises. We see that those four threats may not be we might not be able to continue doing that as our population grows way beyond the eight billion. Right. Now, yeah. if we, right. So if when you look at these things, you say, well, where does graphene fit in this? So graphene has some other properties when you extract it naturally from the raw graphite. One is that it has an, a, a unique compatibility to being able to make a foam or a sponge. Okay. 10 years later, right. After, you know, after, after the 2010, people started looking at the sponge and I, I invested in the sponge and that's the first Ted talk I did. Um, so I featured the sponge on the big screen and, mm -hmm. and then, and then as the research started showing up, we found that the sponge or others found that the sponge I had worked on could actually be modified so that it can create a new uranium species so that the water contaminated with uranium could be, drinkable and this is out of MIT. So so if I didn't make all those investments in the sponge and in a lot of people call it the foam, you know, the foam sponge, though what would have happened in the timeline, right? If I didn't switch to gluten free and then found all these benefits of perhaps changing my pesticide exposure, changing my input, I actually felt better at times because I was never in, when I was in graphene, never in one location for more than a few weeks in a year. So I would be constantly flying from place to place. So I then had, I was living in the air, right? Or in different countries. And then, and then when I went to Greece and then presented in Mykonos, I was doing the anti-cancer stuff with the graphene. My mind was racing, but I could race with my mind because of the <laughs> gluten-free right? Yeah, diet and, and I had more energy. And I then saw that if graphene was combined with the philosophy of the graphene, the theories behind the graphene, which could be antibacterial, we already know that now it can make um, different plastics. But you know, when you grow something outdoors, that the best amount of time from the sun is 11 to one. That's like maximum sun exposure, right? Mm -hmm. And if yeah. you are a plant, that's your time. Imagine if we could make 11 to one from 10 a.m. all the way to 5 p.m. What would happen to your growth rate? Huge. 
right? Or you think, We know, yeah. when we have data for that, do you know? We have data because my graphene work with lithium brought me to Canada with Hydro Quebec in Iraq, but it also brought me to the upstream of how to make lithium in general, and that was Alaska. Okay. And so in Alaska, when I arrived in Alaska, I mean, I, I'm not a Cypriot, but if I, because of our relationship, if one day I, I've never been there, but if I ever went there with you, I know mm -hmm. that I might breathe differently. My heart might um, beat differently because I've never been there and I'm with you, right? So guess yeah. who I'm with in, 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 um, in Alaska? I'm with my wife, my, mm -hmm. my wife. And I'm, I'm now also with some very high level professors who share with me where we get lithium from the Salars, which is a lithium lake. Right? So S-A-L-A-R, learning new terms, right? And I'm looking yeah. at whether or not these things could combine together. And what does that have to do with food? Well, I saw carrots and cabbages and lettuce that were like, I've never seen sizes like that. How do you do this in Alaska? Oh, well, there is a time in Alaska where we just get more sun because we barely have any nights. Hmm. Well, and, and that, so that's all you need. And they said, that's all we need. Of course, they also have the volcanic soil and things like that. So it's not all you need. You need a couple of other things, but seeing is believing. And I've always, and we're talking about the year of maybe 2012, 2013, it stuck with me that what would happen if um, Fingra, you know, we're doing the potholes and things like that, which not everybody runs into potholes. And then when they do, they, they get really upset, but they forget about it. But what would happen if we could change how you make food in your home? for every household and every individual, what if we could change how the sun uh, and the energy, sun is energy, how the energy is made more efficiently using the graphene. Um, and we, we go in that direction. Now, I don't have all the answers, just like I don't have all the answers when I was in 2006. I got different answers as I got into 2010. But I do know one thing, is that if you have enough people working on something, and this is taught by to me, but also to everybody, you know, on Earth now, is that in 2019 we had COVID, and we didn't like mm -hmm. that. A lot of people didn't like that. Nobody really said, "Oh, this is great. Let me have more of this." Right? Um, yeah. I could get, I could get long COVID. So there was funding that was created, and there was also more than the funding because Graphene had funding, but there was a movement. To, for many um, intellectuals to come together to figure out solutions of how we can make life good again. How can yeah. we make it smooth, right? Smoothen mm -hmm. out the, the, the rough spots. And then vaccines came about. Um, mm -hmm. Other techniques came about. The masks were also improved. Um, and so through hygiene and a combination of collective goodwill and efforts, along with funding, of course, we now are in 2023 and look at how the death rates caused by COVID have largely dropped. Yeah. So Incredible. as I'm doing the podcast with you, right, you know, and we're talking about innovation and exploration, right? And I also sp spoke about exponential Y equals X to the fifth, right? So that when you take two derivatives, you're still at the third power, right? You're still yeah. exponential. Well, what is more exponential than the Maslow stuff at the basic level? Do you know that I'll give you a technology that's awesome. It's called organ transplants. It's really awesome because yeah. we are able to take your, your kidney and put it in someone else's kidney, uh, kidney spot and save their life. And you have two. Incredible. Right. Yeah. But social, social ills have led to organ transplants um, connected with human trafficking and all the people coming into the United States on their route up from Panama, some of them um, sell their kidneys so that somebody else could have a great life for $6,000. <clears> so market. we, right, it's a market, right? Now, but then let's keep going down the social ills, which is that um, is that some people thought, well, you're not really smart. You really should sell your kidney. 
So while you're coming up from Panama, why don't I just put a uh, bag over your head and I'll send you over to the butcher and they'll cut out your kidney and I can make the $6,000. Mm-hmm. Without right? without chopping yourself. Yeah. Right, right. So they don't have to chop themselves. It's, it's also a market. It, you know, so is that wrong? You know, the HIV virus does what it does. And is it, is it is it evil? So you start looking at these situations that come from technologies that technology can sometimes be so good at the same time because of existing social ills of food and and shelter create the problem. So so how do you how do you solve for that? If you solve for the food and shelter problem where 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 you you don't um uh if you do it properly then you could get blissful periods in time if you do it improperly then you might get um side effects like uh pesticides and insecticides being overloading and affecting uh resistance levels and bacteria and other things like that so in graphene came in and we were able to take existing um, technologies and to tweak them further into uh, people being able to have food. While it's a highly indirect correlation, right? And maybe the correlation is really weak. But what if people got didn't have to migrate up from Panama? Because over there, there it's just as abundant as it is in this country for food and shelter. What would happen, right? What would happen is that is that what if every place could be similar to Harvard, right? So, right, you know, so this is what this podcast is. This isn't this isn't only for people who go to certain schools to listen to. This is for right. Imagine if conceptually, you could take something and 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 fold it so that there's abundance for many people. Now, where is this inspiration, like the sources of these inspirations coming from? One, which is naturopathic medicine. The other, which is, you know, the Alaska visit and those types of things. And then, and then third is I do a lot of talk about gluten-free, but also eating organic. The thing I dislike the most about talking about eating organic is it's like save thyself, right? If you have enough money, then you can save yourself. But if you can't afford it, then you've got to eat what everyone else is eating. I never like that. Mm-hmm. It always hasn't sit right with me. Um, so so now you look at Fingra and you know we, we got some accolades behind us. We've even attracted a guy, uh, David Goldsmith, who, who talks about creating an ecosystem for uh, individuals working on the moon and in the Earth's atmosphere. So then I said to David, like, if you're going to go and create an ecosystem, how do you feed yourself on the moon <laughs> or, or yeah. on the, all right, how are you going to feed yourself? Um, let alone let we get to Mars or somewhere. Well, he's actually, then he, of course, um, asked me, do you have any patents related to um, Earth's atmosphere and the moon? And I said, no, I don't have anything related to that because I wasn't thinking that way. Just like I wouldn't think, of the food stuff and graphene unless I had all those different inputs. Well, suddenly we're now engaged in the project of how would you feed people up there? Do you know that some seeds may not do well in a micro or zero gravity area? Interesting. Now, they I did not just, know right? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that so interesting? Right. And you know, when I saw my daughters see the um on my screen, the various projects, like there was, you recall this, the water bear, right? Right. The water mm-hmm. bear example, which is not David, right? Somebody else. And so, so there are different systems of scientists and individuals excited about working on uh, human longevity, uh, outer space, not because the earth is going to blow up. I'm excited because do you know what I might transform into by working into in these projects and the knowledge we would be able to get? as a team, right? For solving limitless. some problems, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the limitless concept, right? So rather than have it setting limits, my daughters were really excited in seeing this because now they took out their astronomy book, right? <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. and, then, and, then, and then, you know, I said to them, uh, just being funny about it, is that the word astronomy, like you don't call 
uh, uh, you don't call biology uh, biotomy, right? You call it biology. And I said, you know, if you call it astrology, right? Astrology, astrology is not astronomy. Astrology is where you have those tarot cards and things like that. I said, how in the world did the ology go after astro and end up meaning this? They must have taken it first. They were inspired first, and then the people working on astronomy had to use the onomy, right? <laughs> Yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's about sequence, and we we are we are sequentially. Most of us put all of our eggs onto having someone else exploit us. We're even told to, we're even told to do that. You know, I gave Jack Ma examples, other ones. But as as you and I chat, and we we chat outside of this, and I, is that my my KPI key performance index. set for Fingra is to go and, 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 and work on those projects that have vast consequences to our limitless knowledge. It, to change our DNA in this company, in this startup, right? Because I've done mo so many multiples of these things. I don't want to go and do those. If you, know, you want to die trying to figure out, if we could figure out to allow the sun the exposure from 11 to 1 to instead to 10 to 5 p.m., if we could change the disease profile of plants, because if you were to grow plants uh, differently in a smaller space, two to four feet could feed a family. Imagine what that is. But then the implications on cancer. See, if you were to cut fresh greens directly instead of having them store-bought, what would happen to someone looking and looking for a life force to offset the cancer that's growing in their body. Wow. It's, it's just so incredible how powerful this material and the kind of endless, well, rather limitless possibilities that it presents. Hmm. Um, and I think, I think on that note, that will probably be the end of this episode. Um, and in the next one, we might delve slightly deeper into this kind of food problem and how um, we hope to tackle it with, with reactive graphene. But thank you so much, Dr. Chu. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that these this is dream with me. Um, get distracted and uh, just wait for the next episode, right? <laughs> Amazing. Sounds great. I look forward to it. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Calling All Explorers. To find out more, please visit fingra.com. That is P-H-E-N-E-G-R-A dot com. Thank you.